Today with Joseph Prince. God's prosperity is to prosper you first and foremost in your walk with Him, in your life with Him, amen? And that's, that's what happens when you become righteous through Jesus' blood, amen? For God made Jesus to be sin for us when you know no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Hello, church. Once again, it's my privilege to share with all of you what I believe God is saying to us during this time. And I'm sure that uh, for the past weeks, you've been hearing the word preach along these lines. But I believe that God has so much more for us. And I, He wants us to receive this word in season for all of us during this time. As you know, the whole world is right now in a global recession and it's gonna get worse as, as time goes on. But remember that we are people who are in the world, but we are not of the world. We have a father who cares for us. And if he cares for the sparrows and not a single one of them falls without his knowledge, how much more will he care for you? Amen. So we rest in our father's love and we learn from him how to prosper even during times of famine. If you look in the scriptures, you'll find that every time there's a famine, there's a time that God's person, whoever he has for that hour, whether it's Abraham, whether it's Isaac, whether it's Joseph, they come into prominence. God's people will come into prominence during this time, whether it's in their workplace, whether it's in their companies or wherever, in their ministries, they will come forth during times of famine. It's not during prosperous times. When I say uh, times of famine or prosperity uh, times, I'm talking about the times out there in the world, okay? But it's during times of famine out there in the world that God's people begin to shine because we demonstrate God's light not in the midst of light, but in the midst of darkness. We demonstrate God's ability and power to supply, to provide during times of famine, during times of lack. Something very interesting about uh, famine, you find that uh, God's people always during famine, God gives them wisdom for that famine uh, in, in, in different cases, uh, different famines, you find that God gives wisdom to uh, Joseph to know how to operate during that time. He would recommend to Pharaoh to appoint a man with wisdom to handle the coming famine. And of course, he didn't recommend himself, but in a way, indirectly he did. Because Pharaoh says, how can we find anyone else that has the kind of wisdom like you have? And he appointed Joseph to be his right-hand man. And that's when Joseph got promoted. But that's the wisdom that God gave Joseph during that time of famine. During the time of uh, Abraham, God told Abraham to be honest and own up. And when he lied about his wife, all right, he, he, he came to a place where he had to come clean and he own up. And the Bible says that the first thing he did was that when he came out of Egypt, he built an altar to the Lord. In other words, he prioritized his relationship with the Lord. God is saying, get back to where you lost. You went down to Egypt. Now get back to the place where you first built the altar. And the Bible says he built the altar between Ai and Bethel. And that's where he came back to. Okay, he's always remembering where, where you fell, from where you fell because of your unbelief or lack of faith. So you see that with Abraham, it was a coming back to where he was, where he fell from. In the case of uh, Isaac, the Bible says there was a famine in the days of Isaac, like the first famine of the days of Abraham. Now, many years have transpired. Isaac's now an adult. When, when Abraham went down to Egypt during that famine, uh, there was no Isaac. But many years have come and gone, and now Isaac is facing a famine. But again, there's a wisdom, a specific wisdom that God gave to Isaac, and that wisdom was to sow, was to sow during the time of famine. If you look at the ground at that time, and the, the Bible says it's like the famine of Abraham. If you look at Abraham's famine, it says that the famine was severe. And severe famine is, looks like this. The ground looks like this. Now imagine that kind of ground, and you are told, sow into that ground. Now you know that you gotta do it by faith. You can't do it by sight. By sight, everything is dry, arid. In the natural, you would think that nothing will grow out of this. 
And that's the very challenge that is before God's people today. When God tells them to sow into the gospel, it is not like an investment in something that they, they can see in the future the returns on. They can see the dividends. They will have a share and, and, and they will partake of the profits. But it is something seemingly like in the natural is dry. And that's the very area where God says, sow into that area. If you felt a connection with our program today and you're thinking, yes, tell me more, then we want to give you Joseph's foundational book, Destined to Reign, for free. We want to help you take this journey of discovering the transformative power of grace and experience true victory over life's challenges, lack, and destructive habits today. Request your free copy of Destined to Reign by visiting josephprince.org new or texting new to 71239 today. Offer available to U.S. residents only. You see, the Bible doesn't say that where your heart is, there will your money be, there will your treasure be. It's the opposite. The Bible says where your money is, where your treasure is, there will your heart be. In other, in other words, wherever you put your, your seat, your money in, your heart will follow. If you sow into the gospel ground, your heart will be into the gospel. Amen. That's how you, you, you change the direction of your heart. People try to, you know, uh, uh, turn the whole thing around and, and say that, you know, no, you know, people always put their money where their heart is. No, it's the opposite. Their heart will follow where their money goes. And if you put your money in the gospel ground, even you don't have a vision about the importance of the gospel and how the gospel can transform lives. And, but you start by faith, looking at the gospel like it's dry and you just sow into it you'll find that you'll yield dividends, amen, like Isaac did. And exactly that's what happened to Isaac. The Bible says, and Isaac sowed in that land, that land of famine, in, in the same year, not another year, in the same year of famine, he reaped a hundredfold. So the Bible says the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. So there's this 30-fold, 60-fold, 100 uh, growth, even in prosperity. He began to prosper first, began, there's a beginning, all in the same year. He continued prospering until he became very prosperous, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And of course, that, that caused the uh, Philistines to envy him. The Bible says he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. And the Bible says the Philistines envied him. So don't think for one moment that the world will not criticize you or, or say things about you if you, if you prosper God's way. They, they will even come against that teaching of prosperity as if you know, the Bible doesn't have these teachings. It's okay for the new age to teach it. It's okay for the world to promote it. And it's okay for their people to prosper, but not God's people, right? They, will have a, they, have a, they have a saying, right? That as poor as a church mouse. Why a church mouse? No, my friend, if you study the Bible, look at all these verses. Isaac sowed in the land. He reaped in the same year a hundredfold. He began to prosper, continued prospering, became very prosperous. Why do you think the Holy Spirit put all these verses there? For us to be discouraged from sowing, from giving, from believing God for a harvest. You know, there, there, there are people who say that things like, well, you are, you are giving to receive. You are, you are sowing because you want a harvest. Yes. That's the very thing the Bible encourages us to believe for. That's why these verses are there. God says that Isaac sowed in the year of famine, in that land that's dry and arid, and he reaped. And God told us about it. You know, if God doesn't want to encourage us, why did he tell us what happened to Isaac after he sowed? And, and God went into detail telling us that he began prospering, continued prospering, and became very prosperous. Why did Jesus say, give? and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men give into your bosom. Notice the expression, it's very specific. It's in detail. Even the process, how it's gonna come back to you. Why did Jesus say that? If Jesus didn't want us to expect a return, he didn't expect us to believe for a harvest, why did he encourage us with the result of our giving? with the harvest of our giving. Amen. He could just have said, give in the name of the Lord. Give with a motive to bless others. He could have said that. No, he wants us to be encouraged. 
He wants us to believe that when we give, we will reap. Amen. It will be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Men will give to our bosom. So is this teaching of prosperity in the Bible something that, that uh, uh, God, is, God is saying to us that it's not His will for us to prosper and uh, to be poor is to, re, to, be, to be humble. Poverty is holiness. You don't find that in the Bible. You don't find that in the lives of our, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Even all the heroes of faith in the Bible, the Bible says, you know, all of them prospered in their various fields, whether you know, they're a king, when they walk with the Lord, they begin to prosper. In fact, there's a verse about one of the kings of Judah. As long, notice the way it's, it's phrased, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Notice that? How that seeking the Lord and prosperity is tied up together. So child of God, God wants you to be encouraged. God wants to prosper you. The reason this is such a, 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 a burden, if I can say that, for me, a burden that I want to dispense off, you know, it's not the heavy burden, but, you know, it's like a, God, God arrested me recently and, and told me, it's time for me to preach this in its biblical context. Amen. There, there is an extreme, of course, you know, where people talk about prosperity. It's, it's always about uh, receiving and it's always a blessing. One person or, or uh, just a group of person and, and not having a vision for the gospel. It's all about me, my, and it's about possessions and more possessions. That's not God's idea of prosperity. God's, God's prosperity is to prosper you, first and foremost, in your walk with Him, in your life with Him. Amen. And that's, that's what happens when you become righteous through Jesus' blood. Amen. For God made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Amen. So we are righteous. That's the greatest prosperity of all. In fact, with that righteousness comes all the blessings of the righteous. Like the Bible says, blessings are upon the head of the righteous. That's you. That's me now. Amen. We can receive those blessings. Amen. And then the Bible says about our children, the seed of that's your seat and my seat, our children. The seat of the righteous will be delivered. Amen. We can claim that. It is ours now. When we pray, we can, we can know this in our hearts that God is hearing our prayers and our prayers avail much. Why? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And you are that righteous man now. I am that righteous man. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs, the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the Righteous. Who is the righteous? You and I. We are the righteous. Look at that. Is that in the Bible? Yes. It's in Proverbs 13 verse 22. It's right there. Why is God encouraging us? What, what is He saying to us? That there's a transfer taking place here. The wealth of the sinner, the sinner is, is tasked with gathering and gathering and working hard and, and uh, doing all he can to get a lot of wealth. But God is saying he's storing that wealth for who? For the righteous. Is there only one verse in the Bible that says the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous? No. We have other verses like in Ecclesiastes. The Bible says that exactly what I just said. But God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. Who is that? The man who is righteous. Notice God gives him wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, what does God give? To the sinner, He gives the work of gathering and collecting. So when you see the sinners working out there, you know, and, and they gather a lot of wealth, don't be, don't be envious and don't be jealous. Just know in your heart they're gathering for you. Amen. There's going to be a transfer taking place. And we'll see in a while when that transfer is going to take place. But to the sinner, God gives the work of gathering and collecting. Now watch this. That he, the sinner, may give to him who is good before God. Now, this vanity and grasping for the wind as far as the sinner is concerned. Amen. Everything that he does, all his hard work comes to nothing. Amen. Because a transfer will take place. Has this happened before? Yes. Remember in Exodus 12, the night of the Passover, the Bible says the transfer took place. Years of slaving. Amen. Under the hard taskmasters of Egypt. For about 400 years, the people of God were afflicted. The Bible says on the night of the Passover, this happened. The children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses 
and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor. What did God give the people? Now, this, note this, this is important. The Lord had given the people favor. That's why the Egyptians gave them the articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. Because the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. Now, there's no unrighteousness here, people. For 400 years, the people of Israel were, were afflicted under the Egyptians. All this is actually the back pay plus interest of all those years of working and slaving, building up all the monuments and statues, all right, under the hut, uh, you know, whips of the taskmasters, and now they are receiving their pay with interest. So there's no injustice here, people. In fact, God will always make sure that at the end, it will all be restored back to you. Who is the you here? The righteous. And you, my friend, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, in fact, this is not a, a simple um, uh, incident that happened, it's just what happened. God prophesied specifically that His people will come out of Egypt with wealth, with great possessions. Remember that 400 over years before this, before this slavery in Egypt, God actually appeared to Abraham. Now, Abraham lived before the Egyptian captivity, all right? And Abraham had a dream from God one night. And this is what God said to him. God said to him, Know certainly, God told Abraham, that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And they will serve them and they will afflict them. The Egyptians will afflict them 400 years. Imagine all those years of toiling, laboring without pay. 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterwards, child of God, there's always an afterwards that's coming for you and me. Amen. Believe God. I believe it's going to happen in the end times. Why? Because the story of Exodus, it wasn't in the beginning of the plagues. It wasn't in the middle of the plagues. Amen. It was the last plague. It was the end times that this transfer of wealth took place. Mm, hallelujah. Amen. Are you ready? So unless we preach it, people's hearts are not open to receive it. Amen. And of course, God will do it justly. God does everything righteously and justly. Okay? But let, me, let me finish the verse. God said to Abraham in, in this dream, afterwards they shall come out with what? Great possessions. Now, if God didn't want them to have great possessions, why, why even prophesy about it? As if it's something important. Because there, there are only that many important things to say. You know, when God appears, usually you find that it doesn't give a long discourse. All right? His words are measured and usually it's a short uh, uh, prophecy, right, when he appears. Notice of all the things that he could have said, afterwards they shall come out with joy, you know, or something else. No, he says, afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. Why did God say this? And we see the fulfillment of it just now in Exodus 12, that that night, the Bible says, God gave them favor with the Egyptians. My fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, if you are suffering, all right, in any way during this famine, of lack or shortage in any area, or you're in debt and you can't imagine how you can pay off your debt. First and foremost, you gotta release that faith in your heart to see a God who wants to prosper you. And because of all the teachings that we hear, um, you know, that it, it's so uh, rife now on, on YouTube and uh, social media and, you know, wherever you find people uh, talking about this, it's always like in a negative way, um, about tithing and about, uh, you know, you hear phrases like health and wealth gospel, you know, and I agree, all right? Let me say this. I agree that there are extreme teachings on this where it's all about greed, it's all about covetousness, it's all about the love of money. I'm not referring to that. I'm not talking about prosperity for self-aggrandizement. I'm not talking about for self and only for you and yourself and your family. No, it is prosperity with a purpose. We're talking about Abraham now as an example of how God blessed him. And you see that when God called him, God says, I'll bless you and you 
shall be a blessing. What does that mean? That means I bless you so that you can be a channel. You can be a blessing. And of course, we know that the greater uh, plan of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ because in your seed shall all the nations be blessed. That's the gospel right there. That's what Paul says in Galatians and Romans. In that very verse, in your seed shall all the nations be blessed. So God blesses us even financially, all right, or with great possessions in His, in His words, so that we can channel these things, amen, for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I have a good amen? So we see that God prophesied this 400 years before they came out that, from Egypt, that they would come out with great possessions. And the Bible says on that night in Exodus 12, when they came out, they asked the Egyptians for articles of silver, articles of gold. Notice these are uh, uh, precious items, amen, metals that they asked for, articles of clothing. For what purpose? There's a purpose for this prosperity. Yes, when they came out that night, they were laden down with gold, silver, precious materials. For what purpose? To build God's house. Amen? So right from the start, 400 over years, when God prophesied that, already God had that in mind, that He will prosper His people for a purpose. And the purpose has always got to do with His house. Today, His house is the church of Jesus Christ. That's why, that's where our pious go. That's where our sowing is sown into, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And sometimes we feel like, uh, you know, this, this ground is dry ground. We are looking for the latest creation, the latest innovative ideas to make money. But friend, these this fats come and go. Amen. And you may make money for a while, but you're going to lose a lot in the process. But God's way is this. When God blesses you and God prospers you, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and he adds no sorrow with it. And the word asaph there, sorrow, right, is the word painful toil. He adds no painful toil in that labor. Whereas some of these other things, you may or may not prosper in only one area financially. Yes, you may have a bigger house now, right? You may have a, 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 a one more car, right? But what you gave up to get all that, just in one area, money. God's prosperity is more than just money. So we see that God prospered His people in the end times, the end times for them will be the last days in Egypt, all right? For us, it's our last days in the world. Something gonna happen in the end times. Notice when the transfer took place, like I said just now, it did not happen in the beginning of the plague, nor in the middle of the plague, but the last of the plagues, of the 10 plagues. It was the last. And we, are, we believe that we are the generation that's gonna see Jesus Christ return. What a word we've received today. Subscribe to the Joseph Prince Ministries YouTube channel for daily updates. And don't forget to share it with someone you know. You never know who might need to be encouraged today.